All right. <clears throat> so if it seems like it's for Bhante Nita, I'll pass. And also if I feel that um, it'll be more fun to pass, then I'll pass. <laughs> you mentioned that for meditation, it helps to mm, focus on here and now, like breathing, walking or yoga. Would focusing on petting one's cat be the same? Could that be meditative? Or I think you can use your pet, or rather be kind to your pet, as a way to establish a general attitude of kindness. And certainly by learning to do one thing at a time with great care and attention, and by really giving it all your energy you know, from a place of kindness, then uh, you're preparing the mind, you're developing right intention. And, you know, if you can learn to do one thing at a time and really be present, then of course that's going to, all those little drops in the jar are going to add up. So our daily life is very rich, fertile soil for the practice. And if our meditation remains limited to meditation time, deemed by the bell or by the schedule, then you won't go very far. So certainly, you know, this is all um, part of living a kind and compassionate life. So it depends how you pet it. <laughs> if you pet it because, you know, you want to pet it and it actually doesn't want to come to you and you drag it towards you, then that won't work. And in the same way, if you treat your breath like that, that won't work. You know, the idea is that we allow things to come to us. We allow um, beings to come to us. We allow our friends to be as they are, you know, to come into our lives if they wish and to leave when they wish and treat everybody and everything, including your mind, including your breath, with respect. So certainly if we can develop those kind of intentions and ways of relating to, first of all, our pets, and some people use pets even as objects of their meta-meditation. So we're quite lucky here to have a beautiful uh, husky dog and a little, I don't know what, poodle type dog. So we can perhaps use those also as uh, objects in our meta practice if uh, that's easy for us. So yeah, the object is never as important as the way we learn to relate. And uh, yeah, the more we can really give our energy, give our attention, give our time to one thing at a time, then uh, the more that kind of stillness and uh, in a way, focus builds up, but it's a soft focus. It's a kind of um, um, kind and expansive type of focus, not a narrow or tight one. Yeah. Often, when I am observing my breathing uh, closely, um, the closer I watch the more I realize that I am all doing the breathing In, instead of letting yeah, okay, instead of letting uh, it breathe on its own should I just observe myself doing the breathing instead of struggling to stop but don't stop breathing <laughs> 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 but I understand what you mean. The thing is that you, um, um, if you're doing breath meditation, it would have you have a tendency to kind of control the breath, and then basically we make it unnatural in a way that too strong or too fast, or maybe we force it to be too slow or something like that. The breathing. How you're breathing is an absolutely natural process. So the, the goal is just to observe. Like you breathe, we are breathing all day, all night, all by self. <laughs> and suddenly when you sit down, then we start to mess around with our breath. <laughs> the rest of the day we don't. There's no need for that. Not even when we're sleeping. We don't need to do anything with the breath. And the breath it just adjusts by itself. If we are running or walking, we start to breathe more. And because we need it, the body needs it. And when we're really, really, really relaxed, and go deeper into meditation, the breath is just get more and more subtle and relaxed and going slower and slower. And it happens all by itself. Your body do the breathing for you. 
and you just follow the breath to basically have something to do <laughs> while your body while your body and your mind calms down slowly by itself and I, I do I, I really do understand this this issue that uh, that it's difficult to watch the breath and not do anything uh, but it's uh, I, I, I don't have any trick this is just like a training to more and more just observe the breath you don't need to improve it you don't have to make it long or short or or deep or or kind of shallow just leave it as it is and just watch um, Should I just observe myself doing the breathing? Yes. Try that. How do I sit cross-legged most, oh, most comfortably? My legs take turns in going numb. Is it a matter of... Um, is it a matter of, uh, I'm not sure what, a habit, habit. Thank you, sadhu times three, <laughs> with a big smile. So that's great that your legs are numb and yet you're still smiling, wonderful. At least your smile is not numb, <laughs> your face is not numb. So uh, yeah, sometimes it can be a matter of habit. Uh, I started practicing when I was really young and I guess I had a bit of a gung-ho attitude anyway because I found it all quite fascinating and I wanted to push myself a little bit. Um, but when you're kind of 20 years old, you can do that without damaging yourself. And I wouldn't really recommend that to anyone who's over 20 or even maybe if you're 20, <laughs> unless you've got a long time to get into the habit. So for me, I um, only ever sat for an hour at a time and then I would stretch my legs. But... Uh, I also did a lot of yoga and started doing quite a lot of retreats. So I gradually got into the sitting and it became quite natural for me. And I noticed that in Asia, most people are brought up sitting cross-legged on the floor. They even eat their breakfast, they eat their meals on the floor, they crouch to go to the toilet or the shower, you know, you just kind of crouch and use the bucket. So the hip joints are very flexible and that becomes a very comfortable, natural position to sit in. And most certainly that was the case in the Buddha's day. So in the Satipatthana Sutta, it does say that uh, after establishing the preliminaries in our practice, virtue, a little bit of sense restraint, which we'll talk about this retreat, and some basic mindfulness, then one goes and sits cross-legged with a straight back under a tree. But this is really only because that would have been very comfortable. And uh, even the Buddha used to collect some grass and make himself a very um, pleasant seat under a tree. He wouldn't just sit on the roots of the tree and like, have kind of sharp things poking into him. He tried that kind of method for the first six years of his uh, aesthetic life before he was wise. And uh, I've been to one of the places that he practiced. Even the landscape lends itself to austerities. It's very jagged. The mountains really kind of sharp rocks. And he found that got him nowhere. So in order to actually develop, especially samadhi, especially the stillness and the happy states of mind, we do need to find a comfortable posture. So see if you can find a balance between sitting cross-legged for as long as it feels easeful for you, sometimes perhaps exploring you know, the numbness and not moving immediately just out of reactivity, but being kind being compassionate and if you find that you know it's just not comfortable and you're getting obsessed with that it's distracting you from your meditation then try and uh, adjust your posture you can do it even during the sitting by just recognizing the intention to move recognizing that you're doing it out of compassion and moving very very slowly and gently and you'll barely disturb your mind if it continues to be a problem then try sitting in a chair or try lying down. You can adjust, you can change your postures, you can do walking meditation, so you really don't need to sit through pain. And uh, sometimes the numbness isn't really harmful, isn't really painful, so 
it can pass on its own. You know, you might just want to see what works for you. What is the mental action that corresponds to putting the glass of water down on the floor so that it can fall mm -hmm. into silence? <laughs> That's a <laughs> no mental action. <laughs> you ask asking what is the mental action? The answer is no mental action. Um, of course, you're supposed to be aware and be conscious. But the whole point of that demonstration from this Ajahn Chah and this our tradition is that uh, you're not supposed to do any mental action. That's 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 kind of it's difficult in the beginning, but after a while you learn to just watch and let things happen. Um, we call it letting go, letting be, and and. Basically, it's a training, and I said this morning that one way of letting go, like the result is letting go, but the, the method can, for example, be kindness. So if you want an answer, like a, a mental action, mental like kindness has this um, um, kindness creates this stopping of conflicts, the stopping of, of activities, stopping of quarreling and disagreements. So by doing, uh, by being kind, thing stops. And then you don't do anything. And then you end up letting go, <coughs> letting, <coughs> letting things be. Is there any effect to meditating with the palms up or with the palms down? <laughs> no. Unless one is painful and one is pleasant. There's, I don't think, any effect. Maybe it affects your shoulders, um, but it doesn't really affect anything else. Um, one of the ways I sort of learn to practice sometimes, or that I can find still helpful today, is if I maybe have some kind of restlessness or pain in the body, sometimes anxiety perhaps, that putting the palms up can help me to sense into the feelings in the palms. And the feelings in the palms are usually quite pleasant, quite neutral, maybe tingly or something like this. And it can give a sense of spaciousness to the mind just by staying with the extremities. Sometimes that can help, but I mean, there's actually nothing in it. I mean, if I do that, it's just because of my shoulder. So... There's uh, nothing magic about it. It's a shame, isn't it? We'd love to have a magic posture or like a magic pill or a magic way of putting the glass down. But all of this is just a process, you know, of learning to gradually um, work with our body and minds. And it's never the same twice. And it's never the same for um, one person as it is for another. You know, there are just uh, ways and means. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately, no magic posture. So please meditate wherever you want to put your palms. I don't know if you want to meditate. Actually, that was a bit of a joke, meditating like this. But um, <laughs> one of my, friend, my best friend's mother, actually, is um, a Christian, and she'd been going to church for years and years, and sometimes they kind of sing and, you know, bring up a lot of devotion in the mind. At one time, I used to go sometimes to Sunday school when I was small, and I saw them sort of singing and with their palms up, and I thought, this looks really strange. But apparently one time she was doing that and she was so overcome by devotion and a, a feeling of love that she actually saw a big bright light which she interpreted as union with God or some kind of visit from God. And I don't know, I mean we don't interpret it that way in Buddhism but it seemed to have very similar effects as it can have in meditation because she was just filled with confidence, with faith and with love. And she's one of these people that you could really say is a charitable, compassionate human being. You know, she'll do anything for anyone. She's like the person you want on your street. You know, she'll be going around when everyone else has stopped going to the old lady next door to take meals or to just sit with her and cheer her up. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, that's a bit of an aside, but uh, <laughs> whatever works for you. Yeah. I hope I don't see that. I'll keep my eyes closed. I hope I don't see that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>
what happened to ah uh, this is actually for me as well what happened to your brother Nito uh, you said that he inspired you to do meditations was he also a monk um, what happened to my brother my brother he uh, he I must say he went a long way but he didn't go into he didn't belong to um, like a tradition which has like a defined a properly defined monastic life. In in Buddhism we have like a thick book, just a lot of rules and procedures and how to ordain and what rules and how we should behave, etc. So a lot of lot it's very well defined what ordination is according to the Buddha. But he <clears throat> but he he was in this tradition which was like a bit <laughs> in reality it was a bit homemade thing. They just picked a few things from Christianity and later some from Buddhism and some from Hinduism. And they made this really nice kind of tradition which were quite open for Westerners. So there, there were basically just a lot of people from Europe and North America and, and they did a lot of good stuff, a lot of meditation, long retreats. And I know from experience and talking to them that there were, there were a lot of people having really good uh, developments. They really found peace and joy stillness. Uh, but he, that tradition kind of is very small and then <laughs> yeah, what happened was that the, this, this um, group was run by two people uh, which was married. They were married. And then <laughs> they <laughs> got into a fight and they divorced and the whole thing just collapsed. Mm. First it was split into two, and then one group was in Europe and one in Mexico or something, and they just just slowly just disappeared, and now it doesn't exist anymore at all. So he um, he got a lot of he got a lot of development out of it, and he's still uh, meditating a lot, and he's using those techniques which he uh, was uh, which he learned. Uh, and they had they, they called it like an ordination, but in reality they live like most people do. So it's not it's not like like what we do. Um, and uh, so he didn't uh, kind of ordain like I've done, <clears throat> and now he's just he's living in, in Oslo, and he has a family, and he's working as a lawyer, <laughs> as a partner. A nice life, also. But um, um, for him, uh, spirituality and development ended up like uh, something he do uh, combined with a absolutely normal, nice life. He doesn't do that full time, <coughs> like like I do. But he got a lot out of it, and he learned a lot, and he had a lot of really, really beautiful, nice experiences. <coughs> And um, and he was basically my first inspiration. He told me what he was doing, all his experiences, and how nice it was, etc. So I also wanted to do that. So I'm um, I'm really grateful for what he did. He kind of gave me the first kick in my ass to, kind of <laughs> <laughs> to get me out there, to dare to go out there and do actually do a retreat. Because in my environment, from my this business school environment, going on a retreat, that's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> At least 20 years ago. I don't know how it is today. So, yeah, that's what happened to him. Is he your big brother or little brother? Sorry? Is he your big brother? Or little yeah, brother? A little brother. Yeah. He's your little brother? He's yeah, two oh. years in, uh, younger than me. Okay, <laughs> this looks like a poem. This is sweet. This means that some joy is coming up if you start writing poetry. <laughs> Morning teaching. The peace and happiness inside. I want to catch it, but it just hide. Today I had a teaching, and now I know you can only find peace and happiness by letting go. <laughs> if you still need to do it, to act, add kindness, it will have a huge impact. To all of you with an active mind, just remember, be kind. <laughs> <laughs> That's really nice. That was really well done. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
Oh. <laughs> Maybe I answer a question anyway? Yes, please do. <laughs> That's really nice. <laughs> I'll probably put that on a red patch. <laughs> it's really nice, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if it's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> when I meditate in day to day life, I'm, I'm reading it like a poem, sorry. When I meditate in day to day life, I'm not on retreat, I find it may take about two hours for my mind to find some ease. Seriously, it rhymes. So, <laughs> so far on retreat, it feels this way in minutes. Mmm. Any recommendations for the causes required to perhaps find this ease quicker in day-to-day -day life? The cause for that is this retreat. Very easy. <laughs> it's all about practice. So by being on retreats, you're conditioning your mind to remember how to find that ease and to become skilled in that. So really, it's the practice. It's the continuity that uh, is the best um, prediction of success in meditation. It's uh, just... Um, learning the kind of happiness that's really worth pursuing and I'll talk about that tomorrow but it's very very different from the happiness we get through the senses the happiness that's a, a stimulating kind of exciting even agitating happiness so see if you can just really enjoy whatever ease you have during this retreat without trying to grasp it that's really important because then it's not easeful anymore you know the ease comes up when we uh, just let things be and we become easy and easeful with whatever arises. Um, so this is the practice, this is the training ground and I would just say um, keep practicing and see if you can expand that sense of ease to whatever mental states arise. It doesn't mean that because it's been easy so far it will carry on to be, but real contentment, real happiness, real ease comes when we can have that same sense of acceptance, unconditional mindfulness, I like this word, to whatever's arising. So uh, then we have more strength and capacity to um, face whatever ups and downs we experience in life. Of course it's going to be much more challenging. Here you're with a, a group of people who are all here for the same purpose, with beautiful intentions, you know, really, really good people living ethical lives. And in the world, you know, maybe you fit, find people, maybe you even work with people who don't have the same values as you. But um, if you can have that ease and compassion inside, then you might find that rather than being affected adversely by the external circumstances, you actually become a positive influence for the people you're around. So this is uh, your training ground and you've got uh, seven more days. So uh, just keep finding that ease with whatever arises and uh, trust that this is going to manifest in your day-to-day -day life. So I'm sure we'll talk more about, you know, ways to do that later in the retreat, but right now, your day-to-day -day life is here. You know, whatever has happened so far in your life is completely over, it's completely finished. This is a hiatus and the future beyond this retreat doesn't exist. So this is it. This is your break from life and uh, try not to go back there too soon. <laughs> Where can I read about the Eightfold Path? Yeah. Uh, of course, you can read about the Eightfold Path in the original teachings of the Buddha, which exists both in Pali and uh, Sanskrit language, translated into English. Um, I um, um, I have this uh, preference when when it, when it comes to kind of understanding the eightfold path is like theoretically like to give like a nice presentation of what it is, not how to kind of <laughs> practice it, but to get like an intellectual understanding. Of what is it? What did the Buddha teach? Then I very often uh, point back to Bhikkhu Bodhi and his uh, translations. And there's this book in, in the word of the... No, mm -hmm. what, is it in the word of the Buddha? The uh, one? No. The I don't know. But in, in the Buddhist word, yes. In the Buddhist yeah. words, yeah. And there's actually one called The Eightfold Noble Path by yeah. Bhikkhu Bodhi yeah. as well, a little booklet. That's yeah. really good. It's really good, but it's... Bhikkhu uh, Bodhi. Yeah. Bhikkhu the Bodhi. Eightfold Path. Yeah. yeah. So then... And that's the best recommendation I can give if you want to find the Buddhas closest we get to the Buddha today is in those books uh, by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Mm -hmm. 
But then mostly all teachers have their descriptions of like the Eightfold Path and how to practice it, including this this book from from Ajahn Brahm. He has like, this uh, um, mindfulness, bliss, and beyond. Basically, the whole book is about the Eightfold Path, <laughs> but mainly focused on on the uh, the later part of the Eightfold Path. But if I am to recommend something, and you really want to go as close as possible to what we have of the Buddha today, in Sanskrit and in Pali, then I recommend Bhikkhu Bodhi. He's living in, uh, he's a Bhikkhu, uh, living outside New York, in the uh, United States. Okay? How can I know the difference between deep meditation and falling asleep and dreaming while sitting? <laughs> So, while sitting, you might not know the difference, especially if you're in a deep state of sleep. <laughs> um, but the main difference will be the result it gives. So, if you come out of that meditation and your mind is really bright and empowered and full of bliss and very light, and I mean, it depends on the depth, right? But at least some of these qualities should be there. Then it's likely that... Uh, and also that your mindfulness is increased, I think that's the main difference, um, then it's likely that you are getting fairly deep in your meditation, whatever deep might mean to you. Um, if, however, you come out and you feel kind of peaceful, but you feel kind of a bit sleepy and your eyes are kind of, you know, not just physical tiredness, but actually your mind is a little bit kind of as though you've just woken up, then you can probably imagine that that might have been sleep. And that's okay, because sometimes that's actually what the mind needs to do, or the brain needs to do, um, in the first few days of retreat. And sometimes it's even an aid to the meditation, because at least when you're a bit sleepy, you're not overthinking. And the sleepiness is kind of all comer from overusing your brain in your life. So, yeah, I don't know if I'm getting sleepiness, but I'm definitely getting a lot of quietness in my mind because it just doesn't want to think. It's thought too much in the last while, and uh, the thoughts are very, very thin. So this is quite nice, and, and if I can just stay with that and be um, peaceful with that, and not fall asleep, but develop um, a sense of valuing that peace, even if it's not very energised just yet, then it starts to brighten. It's almost like especially in a, in a tropical country, you get this kind of haze over the landscape, sometimes over all the trees. In England it happens too. The whole world looks like full of mist. And sometimes that's the uh, precursor to a very sunny day. So when the sun starts to rise, it starts to burn off that mist and then you get these really clear blue skies. And in tropical countries, it's usually an indication that it's going to get very, very hot. Um, so sometimes we can just sit with and do nothing and allow that mist to clear on its own just by having that attitude of kindness and uh, being as aware as you can. But don't try to be aware. Like, don't actually use energy to be aware. Just wait. And that mist will kind of dissipate all on its own. So, uh, yeah. If you're not sure, then it's most likely that uh, it's a slightly dull, sleepy, peaceful state. Yeah. But don't judge it, that's okay. Oh yeah, okay. How do you make the best out of karma yoga? And I actually have, um, I, was, I was kind of starting to say that in the beginning, because I talked a little bit about karma yoga. Um, karma yoga, yeah, you might look at it, okay, well, I don't want to do that, and as I, I want to meditate instead of, or I want to kind of go for a walk instead of doing karma yoga. The thing is, uh, and I, I, can, I can revive back, uh, go back to my first retreat uh, in Norway. Uh, that's, uh, well, it must be like 20 years ago now. And we had those chores there as well. And I was put on dishwashing, <laughs> the worst chore, and I have to do dishwashing every day for nine days. Um, but I got quite good conditioning from my general <coughs> before that retreat. And I decided to um, uh, uh, try to, instead of looking at my dishwashing as something I don't want to do and it's boring, I don't want to do it. I 
turned it around and made it into giving and generosity and helping. I did my part of doing something so everybody can, could kind of eat and it was clean and was nice. And, and honestly, I remember one of the last days there, I, I was washing the dishes uh, and I, I, I managed to make that into something beautiful, something really um, positive for my retreat. I was giving, I was serving, and I, my mind was just, um, uh, I was so happy washing dishes in the end. And I remember one of the last day, I, days, I, I kind of, after dishwashing, like, why am I happy washing dishes? What's going on here? How can dishwashing be a happy chore? But for me, it was a happy chore because I made it into, I looked at it as something positive, something giving, something generosity, something kindness. That was what, that's how I looked at it. So I made it into basically some kind of meditation. So that is how uh, you can make the best out of this karma yoga. That's my suggestion. Try to look at it um, mentally as something very positive you do uh, for everybody else. And also uh, for yourself. And then uh, you, you have like a positive spin on it and you will not be just doing it with a grudge or with some negativity. You will be kind of, uh, you, will, you will kind of uh, doing it with a smile. So that's my suggestion. Turn around your own perception of it. Don't look at it as something negative, as a burden, because it's not. It's an opportunity to be kind, to serve, to be generous, and that has a positive effect on our mind. So whether it's vacuum cleaning or you're chopping up some vegetables, I, I basically I don't know what you're doing. Um, uh, look at it and try to have a positive perception of it. If I give my best but make absolutely no progress at all after eight days, it's still okay, right? <laughs> yeah. Even though you can't measure whether you've made progress or not, so yes. <laughs> Any outcome can be accepted, right? Wow, you're already enlightened, right? <laughs> Very good. Yes, in theory it can, absolutely. And the thing is, if you can take away any sort of um, uh, pressure that you might otherwise put on yourself, then you'll have a much better retreat. The whole point of practice is to learn to accept whatever arises and to understand that it's really nothing to do with you. You know, we can try our best, we can put all our wisdom, all our kindness into something, but whether or not that has effects or when that has effects is beyond our control. I mean, my uh, conviction after so many years of practice and understanding the workings of the mind is that it always will have beneficial effects, but it just might not manifest in the way you think it should, or at the time that you think it should. Um, so it's better not to have particular expectations or even ideas of what deep meditation might feel like or what piti sukha is, even though I'll talk a bit about them tomorrow. They can manifest in so many different ways and quite often we're looking for, for our own idea of what something is, we miss what's actually there. So yeah, one of the qualities of loving kindness is to learn to not only accept but actually embrace whatever arises and to widen that circle of what we can include, what we can embrace. So even if, um, you know, yeah, you give your best and you experience a lot of suffering in this retreat, then don't worry, because suffering is also one of the ways to liberation. You know, the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, and that suffering is to be understood. So if that's what you're getting on this retreat, wonderful. You know, you'd be having it anyway, right? You'd be having it anyway in daily life, but now you've got a chance to learn from it. So it's really a win-win. If you're suffering, if you're unhappy, if you experience depression or anxiety or just lots of physical pain, boredom, that's like the worst nightmare for people these days. 
this is great, you know, this is where a path can begin because you start to understand these things and learn also a wise way of uh, relating, a skillful way to handle them. And if you're experiencing, you know, other emotions that are positive, that are joyful, you know, you find that you can be kind at least some of the time. I mean, it's easy to be kind when things are easy, right? That doesn't take a lot of skill, but to be kind when things don't go your way, that really is developing uh, wisdom, developing courage, developing compassion. And these things really count. So if you're having what you would call a difficult retreat, that's all grist for the mill, you know. This is all going to strengthen you in the long run and build your resilience, build your compassion to others who also go through difficult times. And if you're having a lot of peace and kindness and a feeling of uh, maybe even bliss arising in the mind, then wonderful, but learn to handle that skillfully too. Not to get attached, not to um, kind of shine up your sense of self because you're experiencing wholesome states or uh, emotions that are agreeable to you because this is nothing to do with you either, it's just cause and effect. So you're right, three times. <laughs> So wonderful. But don't worry about the results and the what happens after the eight days. Every moment is a moment to be kind. Yeah. Every single moment that we realise, okay, there's a little bit of tightness or there's a bit of resistance and we recognise it and then we can just soften. We can just relax with that. This is progress on the path. Oh, okay. There's uh, okay. Will there be guided yoga sessions? If yes, when? <laughs> is there? Will there be? Is, is, there, is there? Is that happening? This trick? Yes, so, I will do it, but I haven't said when. Yeah. Okay. 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 So then the answer is that when the sun is not up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Tuesday. Yeah. So uh, it the so answer is yes. Tuesday yep. at four. Tuesday, okay, so At Tuesday is the first day. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Okay, and then do you plan to do this like every day or when? I don't know, but at least just if you want to, if you want to do some yoga, it's the in the yoga room, isn't it? Yeah. Tuesday, four o'clock, and then you just see how how much and when, etc. Okay. I got the easy one. You did. <laughs> They're all quite easy today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Don't speak so soon. <laughs> Can we at some... Oh! <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, this implicates me. Can we at some point during the retreat have meta meditation with Venerable Chanda chanting at the end, please? <laughs> at some point, I think so. Although, oh, it might be towards the end. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. If you're desperate for it earlier, <laughs> you can ask me again. All right. That was easy too. Yeah, I don't remember the plan, but probably, yeah. Yeah. We'll see how yeah. it goes. I, I vote yes, but I don't need <laughs> to do it. <laughs> okay. Um, how, uh, how have your dreams changed during your journey since you discovered meditation? Or have they changed at all? And then I, I guess this is like dreams kind of life, about life, not kind of dreams you have at night. Because both changes. <laughs> <laughs> But I can, I basically, I can answer both. I can take the, the, the dreams at night. The thing is that um, when you practice a lot, you, uh, uh, you get more and more skilled in creating a peaceful, kind, stable mind. And the result of that <coughs> is that that also happens in your, uh, in your sleep you basically stop dreaming. You're just very, very, very peaceful. You hardly have any dreams. You just have this really solid, um, nice, deep sleep. That's how, how I see it. And that's also the teachings of the Buddha. If you do a lot of metta, you sleep really well. You sleep deep. And you, you wake up really happy. 
So all the, all the training we do uh, in meditation, it kind of, um, it also changes how we sleep. And in a really good way. But then the dream like of, of life, for me, I was, I planned to start a business <laughs> uh, within um, uh, sport. I wanted to go into travel, the travel industry, and start up a, uh, I wanted to make a global business. And, and, and kind of, uh, all kind of sp outdoor sports, like ski, skiing and surfing, and all kind of playing, having fun in sports, in different, different, uh, different countries. That's what I wanted to do. But then, um, when I found that, it's much more fun to meditate. <laughs> so my dreams changed from kind of making, like being, like being active and doing sports out in nature. That, what, that was what I liked the most to do when I was, before I got into meditation. All kinds, anything from diving and skiing and paragliding, anything just out in nature having fun. That was what I liked to do. And, and I wanted to make that my job, to do those things. And I got this business, business education, so I, I, kind of, I was kind of learning how to start a business doing that. And then I started to, uh, to meditate. And I got really good instructions from, from my teacher, Ajahn Brahm. And basically what I found was that meditation is much, much, much more fun than all the fun sports I've done before. Much, much more fun. And then basically my dreams changed into this thing. <laughs> <laughs> instead of having sports and having fun and traveling around, backpacking and doing all kind of... I, I even went to Costa Rica to learn kayaking in the rivers there. But I, I, I found that just looking inside and developing my mind uh, gave me much, much, much more like quality, quality of life than having fun with my body. So then my dreams changed into like a full-time development of my mind. That's how my dreams changed. <laughs> and this is probably what I will do in the rest of my life. So it has changed for me. Nearly at the bottom. <laughs> How do you feel right now? <laughs> it sounds like the morning at my monastery. How do you feel? What do you notice? <laughs> How do I feel? I feel quite relaxed, quite inspired, still sleepy, but quite peaceful and uh, I just feel privileged to live this monastic life and have good friends on the path. It's wonderful to be here with Ajahn Nito. I feel like it's really nice when we answer the questions because, I mean, we both have a slightly different angle, but very complementary. And um, even the reading material we kind of agree on. Yeah. And it's just really lovely because for me in uh, England, I'm pretty isolated. I haven't had other monastics around for like most of eight years. Um, I've had another nun come over from uh, Perth. Uh, for a few months last year and she's here for this year as well but bit by bit they're starting to become much more of a community that's uh, part of the communities here I know many of you and some of you are from England too um, and also other monastics are coming to stay so actually I'm feeling a lot of blessings of my life and in the last meditation I was just bringing up which is not something I often do to be honest I should do it more bringing up the goodness of my life and, and how far we've come because really this is a time when I can celebrate and I think too often in our lives we um, you know we get uh, we come to some kind of uh, point where there's some success or some um, outcome from all the hard work and love we've put into something and then we go oh, yeah 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 carry on you know must do the next thing must fix the plumbing blah blah but in the last week or two, I've just started to really take in the beauty that surrounds us now in Oxford and, you know, enjoy meeting some of the local monks. And so this feels like an extension of that. And I feel blessed to have more time for my own practice here and also uh, time to practice 
uh, a lot of love and kindness towards all of you. So, yeah, I feel uh, sleepy, but also not concerned about that. And, uh, and quite looking forward to deepening uh, the retreat together in the next few days. So, yeah, I think that's how I feel. Grateful and... Um, Grateful. Grateful and blessed, I even would say. Mm. Thanks for asking. No one ever asks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last questions. Uh, and we only have three minutes left. So, uh, let's see. Can you give some examples of topics you have addressed in the course of private interviews in the past? Oh, <laughs> that's more or less everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some example topics you have. Uh, but okay, the, the th those those interviews we're doing, and and we're starting tomorrow. Uh, I think tomorrow four o'clock. And I think the, the 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 topics there. It's made for those. It's it's basically about your practice. Uh, like you're doing something and you're stuck and like how do you kind of get out of this problem and you have this issue so which is kind of special for you so it's not you feel maybe you feel that it doesn't it's, it's no point of asking this in uh, for everybody like in the evening there's something there's something very specific for your practice and you want uh, like a comment uh, from from one of the teachers on, on your kind of uh, situation and your your point in, in, uh, in meditation. So th those those discussion is about mostly they are about people's experiences in meditation, and you want some advice like how what do I do now? This happened, and then either it was either difficult, it's very funny, or it's very interesting, or very blissful. And what do I do now? And how can I avoid this? Etc. Etc. But that's what these this interviews are for. It can be anything uh, about Buddhism, etc. But the, the point that why we're doing this is to give some guidance <coughs> just for your particular uh, situation where you're kind of stuck. That's, that's where we can kind of uh, give some advice uh, only for you. That's the... Uh, the uh, uh, that's why we're doing it, and and that's the topic. It's meditation, mostly. Okay. We try to avoid kind of like I don't know, like counseling, like private life. That's it. Oh, I have this. <laughs> I, have, I have this husband. Or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so. It's a, we, we do this, like the counseling, uh, the, the advice you give, we give during this retreat, we try to focus on the spiritual part, the, the, uh, the development, the meditation, the mindfulness, kindness, the eightfold path, etc. That's what it's for. So please uh, feel uh, welcome to come and uh, ask questions if you like. It's, it's there for a purpose. Okay. Now it's nine o'clock. Amazing. Amazing. Bang on time. We, yeah. 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 Just in time. Just warming up. So today. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so more questions, please, for tomorrow. <laughs> and then um, those who wants to, we have six o'clock. Yeah. And actually, one question. Um, they have moved, the breakfast is now quarter past seven, yes. and then we have a group meditation from six to seven. And I, I like this idea of just going, to, going directly from meditation straight to breakfast. Mm. It's like you do one hour of meditation, and then you have to sit like, oh, I have to wait 15 mm. minutes for, for breakfast. <laughs> so I'm thinking, should we, do, should we change something? Should we have, should we start quarter past six, mm. uh, the group meditation? So then we do one hour, and then we can go straight for eating. I, I like this floats, this diary <laughs> float of meditation. And then, now, yes, I'm meditating. Now, I, now I deserve my food. <laughs> <laughs> or, or what do you want? Uh, how, how do you, what do you like?
Any, uh, for those of you who want yes. to, a few of you, quite a few of you are coming. It's just a suggestion. I think everybody's nodding. Everybody nodding. I'm nodding. Oh, you're nodding, okay. <laughs> so, so then we, if we put it this way. Um, I would be coming at least like quarter past. You can come six, six, six. Uh, uh, come at four if you want. To. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Come at three. I mean. No problem. But, and if you like to come at six, you can. But then you can say that from six, quarter past six, then everybody kind of should be here, so we don't disturb everybody else by coming late. But then come six if you want to, come quarter past six if you want to, and then you may, I, I will kind of ring the bell, or one of us will ring the bell quarter past six, and we go straight for breakfast. Is it okay? Yeah, let's do that. Cool. Have a nice evening. Nice. See you tomorrow.